etymology of English. English, people of England, the speech of England, Old English, contrasted to Danish, Frenish, etc., from Engel, plural, the Angles, the name of the Germanic groups that overran the island in the 5th century, supposedly so called because Angle, the land they inhabited on the Jutland coast, was shaped like a fish hook. The term was used from the earliest times without distinction from all the Germanic invaders, Angles, Saxons and Jutes, and applied to their group of related languages by Alfred the Great. After 1066, the population of England, as distinguished from Normans and French, a distinction which lasted only about a generation. The etymology of Albion. Albion. Ancient name of England, Old English, from Latin. Sometimes said to be from the non-Indo-European base Alb, meaning mountain, which also is suggested as the source of Latin Alps, Albania and Alba, an Irish name for Scotland, but more likely from Latin Albus, meaning white, see Alb, which would be an apt description of the chalk cliffs of the island's southern coast. <coughs> Etymology of Britain, 1300, allegedly. Bretagne, from Old French Bretagne, <laughs> and my pronunciation is appalling, so please forgive me, from Latin Britannia, earlier Britannia, from Brittany, the Britons, see Britain. The old English place name Britainland meant Wales. If there was a Celtic name for the island, it has not been recorded. Oh, really? From 757 to 796, Offa House of Mercia, 802 to 839, Egbert House of Wessex, the next one, Athelwulf, House of Wessex, Athelbald, House of Wessex, Athelbert, House of Wessex, Athelred, House of Wessex, Alfred the Great, House of Wessex, Edward the Elder, House of Wessex, Athelstan, House of Wessex, Edmund, House of Wessex, and that takes us up to 946, Edred, House of Wessex, Edwy, House of Wessex, Edgar, House of Wessex, Edward the Martyr, House of Wessex, Ethelred the Unready, House of Wessex, Edmund Ironside, not in a chair, I don't think. House of Wessex. <laughs> King Canute. No, you have to get that right. It's very easy not to. King Canute, House of Denmark. And this, this takes us up to 1035. At 1035 to 1040, Harold I, Harefoot, House of Denmark. 1040 to 1042, Harthur Canute, House of Denmark. 1042 to 1066, critical year. Edward the Confessor. 1066, same year. Harold II, back to the House of Wessex. And 1066 to 1087, William the Bastard, the House of Norman. Historia Ecclesiastica, Gentis Anglorum, by the Venerable Bede. This is one of the, the most quoted historical documents, and it's one of the oldest. He lived from 673 to 735, and he, he lived over the Tyne from where I am currently based. Britain, an island in the ocean, formerly called Albion, is situated between the north and west, facing though at a considerable distance, the coasts of Germany, France and Spain, which form the greatest part of Europe. This island at present, following the number of the books in which the divine law was written, he's talking about the ecclesiastical histories written by the Church of Rome, contains five nations, the English, the Britons, notice the distinction, Scots, Picts and Latins, each in its own particular dialect, cultivating the sublime study of divine truth. The Latin tongue is, by the study of the scriptures, become more common to all the rest. At first, this island had no other inhabitants but the Britons, from whom it derived its name, and who, coming over into Britain, as is reported from Amoriga, <coughs> possessed themselves of the southern parts thereof. This is the Historia Britonum by Nennius, and this is a version translated by J.A. Giles. The island of Britain derives its name from Brutus, a Roman consul. Its inhabitants consist of four different people, the Scots, the Picts, the Saxons, and the ancient Britons. Where's the fifth gone? This is after Bede. It is fertilized by several rivers which traverse it in all directions, to the east and west, to the <coughs> south and north, but there are two preeminently distinguished among the rest, the Thames and the Severn, which formerly, like the two arms of Britain, bore the ships employed in the conveyance of riches acquired by commerce. The Britons were once very populous, and exercised extensive dominion from sea to sea. So this is the ninth century. This is a, a revered history of Britain, and he's saying that through commerce, the Britons, they brought in untold wealth 
Well, weren't we told at school that we were just a bunch of savages who were civilised by the Anglo-Saxons and we had no laws, no equity, no justice? It was just a free-for-all? Oh, I certainly was. This is the Irish version of Historia Britonum. I have taken pains to write certain fragments and I am Nenamnis, that's another version of Nennius, a disciple of Eulodark, because the folly of the ignorance of the nation of Britannia have given to oblivion the history and origin of its first people, so that they are not commemorated in writings nor in books. But I have brought together the histories that I found in the annals of Rome, out of the chronicles of the learned saints Isidora, Jerome and Eusebius, in the annals of the Saxons and the Gaels, and what I discovered from the tradition of our own old men. Numerous are its cares or cities, innumerable its rafts or forts and its fortified castles. Four races inhabit the island of Britain, the Gaels, the Kruthnak Picts, the Britons and the Saxons. Again, the Latins are missed out. The Britons at first filled the whole island with their children, from the Sea of Ict to the Sea of Ork, both with glory and excellency. Now this document, this is one of the most suppressed documents of all time, the Bruticillo, also known as the Chronicle of England, or the Chronicle of Britain, or the Britons. And this again, it's a translation from an Oxford historian. So, and as we go on, you'll see the plethora of deceptions or omissions or mistakes, depending on which way you want to look at it. Britain, the best of the islands, which used to be called Albion, the White Island, Situated as it is in the Western Ocean between Frank and Ewerden, that's France and Ireland, extends 800 miles in its length and 200 in its width, and whatever men must needs use, it supplies them in unfailing plenty. And with this, it is full of numerous wide-spreading plains and noble hills and havens to which, from overseas, come foreign products in great variety. And there are also in it forests and thickets full of various kinds of animals and wild beasts, and many swarms of bees gathering honey among the flowers. There are with this fair pastures at the front of the windswept mountains and bright clear springs, and further there are lakes and rivers full of various varieties of fish, and so it is peopled by five nations, the Britanniat, the Normandiad, the Cesson, Saxons, and the Ficti <laughs> the Picts, <laughs> that's the Picts, um, and the Isagotide. Of all of these, the Britanniad were the first to settle from Morid, the Channel, as far as the Sea of Eden, the Irish Sea, until the vengeance of God came upon them for their sins. Well, it's another monk talking. Now we come to the triads of the Isle of Prydain. Can you remember any of those historians talking about Prydain? <laughs> no. And these triads, they predate all of those historical works, because these are the triads of the Bards who were supposedly the Welsh bards, but they were really the Britons, the British bards. The bards were the conveyors of the knowledge and the wisdom that was handed down from, from generation to generation when things were not committed to paper for fear that people would lose the memory of them. One, there were three names given to the Isle of Prydain. Before it was inhabited, it was called the Seagird Greenland. Later, it was called the Honey Island. The people formed a tribe called the Cymry on the Isle of Prydain after Prydain ap Aed the Great. And no one has any right to it but the tribe of the Cymry, for they first took possession, and before this time there were no persons living on it, but it was full of bears, wolves, crocodiles and bison. The key to the history of these lands lies in the history of the Cambrians, as they were formerly known, the Welsh, the Cymry. Two. There were three primary divisions of the Isle of Prydain, Cymru, Lugria and Alban. Sound like Albion? The rank of sovereignty belongs to each of the three under a monarchy and voice of the country. They are governed according to the regulations of Prydain and to the nation of the Cymru belongs the right of establishing the monarchy by the voice of the country and the people according to rank and primeval right under the protection of such regulation. Royalty ought to exist in every country in the Isle of Prydain, and every royalty ought to be under the protection of the voice of the country. Therefore it is said, the country is more powerful than the Lord. 3. There are three pillars of the social state in the Isle of Prydain. They are the voice of the country, royalty and judicature, according to the regulation of Prydain. 4. 
There are three pillars of the nation of the Isle of Prydain. The first was Hugh the Mighty, who brought the nation of the Cymri first to the island of Prydain. And they came from the summer country, which is also called Defrobani, the summer land, or Atlantia. And they came over the hazy sea to the Isle of Prydain, where they settled. The second was Prydain, who first organised a social state of sovereignty in the land of Prydain. For before that time there was no justice but what was done by favour, nor any law except that of superior force. The third was, and this guy is probably the most amazing of all the hidden British kings. The third was Divinwal Malmud, for he first made arrangements respecting the laws, maxims, customs and privileges of the country and the tribe, and by these reasons they were called the three pillars of the nation of the Cymri. Five, there were three social tribes of the Isle of Prydain. The first was the tribe of the Cymri, who came to the Isle of Prydain with Hugh the Mighty because he would not possess a country and lands by fighting and pursuit, but by justice and tranquillity. The second was a tribe of Lugrians, who came from Gascony, and they were descended from the tribe of the Cymri. The third were the Brythons, who came from Amorica, and were descended from the tribe of the Cymri. These were called the three peaceful tribes because they came by mutual consent and tranquility. And these tribes were descended from the primitive tribe of the Cymri, and all three tribes had the same speech. This was one nation with many different clans and three different sovereignties, all coexisting without war, without conquest, and without tyranny. Six. There were three refuge-seeking tribes that came to the island of Prydain, and they came under the peace and permission of the tribe of the Cymri, without arms and without opposition. The first was a tribe of Caledonians in the north. The second was the Irish tribe, who dwelled in the highlands of Scotland. The third were the people of Galidon, who came in naked... That's Holland, the low countries. Who came in naked vessels to the Isle of Wight when their country was drowned, where they had <coughs> land granted to them by the tribe of the Cymri. They had no privilege of claim in the island of Prydain, but they had land and protection assigned to them under certain limitations, and it was stipulated that they should not possess the rank of native Cymri until the ninth <coughs> of their lineal descendants. Nine generations down, they became natives of Britain. 7. There were three invading tribes that came to the island of Prydain and who never departed from it. The first were the Coranians, who came from the country of Powell. The second were the Irish Picts, who came to Alban by the North Sea. The third were the Saxons. The Coranians were settled about the River Humber and the shore of the German Ocean. The Irish Picts are in Alban, about the shore of the Sea of Denmark. The Coranians and the Saxons united, and by violence and conquest brought the Lugrians into confederacy with them, and subsequently took the crown of the monarchy from the tribe of the Cymri. There remained none of the Lugrians that did not become Saxons, except those that are found in Cornwall and the Comot of Canaban in Dera and Benicia in this period. In this manner, the benevolent tribe of the Cymri, who <coughs> preserved both their country and their language, lost the sovereignty of the island of Prydain on account of the treachery of the refuge-seeking tribes and the pillage of the three invading tribes. History of Britain from the Flood to A.D. 700 by Richard Williams Morgan. The notion so sedulously inculcated first by pagan, then by papal Rome, that all nations except the two occupying the little peninsulas of Greece and Italy were barbarians, may be now classed among the obsolete impositions on medieval credulity. It must at the same time be conceded that the Roman polity did not commence with the first Latin authors, whose date is barely a century before Julius Caesar, that would be 54 BC around about and that the refinement of the prehistoric age, which could produce an Iliad, was something very wide indeed from a myth. The Trojan descent of the Britons has been assigned the place to which it is substantially entitled in this history. It solves the numerous and very peculiar agreements in the social and military systems of prehistoric Britain and Asia, which would otherwise remain inexplicable. It has always been consistently maintained by native authorities, and by extending the circle of researches, it is found to receive ample and unexpected confirmations from the earliest documents of Italy, Gaul, Britannia, Spain, and even Iceland. 
On equally solid grounds of evidence, the social state of Britain has been described as from its first settlement by Hugh the Mighty, again this is confirming what we've already read in the more ancient texts, that of a civilised and polished community, had no other monument of Cymric antiquity but the Code of British Laws of Malmitius, he says BC 600, but it was actually BC 400, around about then, which still forms the basis of our common or unwritten law, descended to us. We could not doubt that we were handling the index of a civilization of a very high order. In such a code, we possess not only the most splendid relic of pre-Roman Europe, but the key to all our British, as contradistinguished from continental institutions. After perusing it, we stand amazed at the blindness which wanders groping for the origin of British rights and liberties in the swamps of the motherland of feudal serfdom, Germany. What, what we've just been through for the lads who've just come in, what we've just been through is the basic... No, I really can't explain. I'll tell you later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we come back to the Bruticillo, the much-suppressed ancient history. And the kingdom was rent into five parts, each part under its own king, which kings continually fought one another. After many years, there arose a famous youth named Donvalo Malmitius. He was the son of Clotten, a petty king of Cornwall, and his beauty and courage outshone that of all the kings of Britain. And he restored the land to its ancient dignity and compiled laws which are known to this day as the laws of Donvalo Malmitius, which even the Saxons obey. And he granted right of sanctuary to temples and to cities, and even to certain roads defined by law, so that any man who fled to them, whatever wrong he had done, should find sanctuary there, unimpeded and without license from his foes. Now this is a, an essay by, uh, uh, again, uh, a, a guy who had connections with Oxbridge, but he certainly wasn't an establishment man, and you'll get that from this quote. His name's Flinders Petrie. The condition of pagan Britain is remarkably preserved in the laws of Divinwall Mulmud. That these laws are certainly long before the 10th century is proved by the gulf that exists between the state of society shown by them and that of the laws of Howell fixed to AD 914. The laws of Howell refer back to Mulmud. What takes the laws of Mulmud at least to Roman times is that they are purely pagan, he means Druidic. How much farther back those laws may date towards the traditional time of Mulmud, the 4th or 7th century BC, we cannot now inquire. That's because of how much history has been erased. The whole air is that of simple conditions and a free life, with much personal cultivation and sympathy and general conduct. It would be impossible to produce such a code from a savage or violent people, and this intimate view of their life is the best ground for judging of their qualities. Okay, this is a Stuart's historian, so an establishment historian we're talking about here. Percy Enderby says in his history published in 1661 that Malmitius took upon himself the government of Brittany, i.e. Britain, in the year of the world's creation 4748. Meanwhile, the Tudor historian Hollinshed reported in the 1587 edition of the Chronicles that Malmitius began his reign over the whole monarchy of Britain in the year of the world 3529. That's 439 BC in the current calendar. Both authors agree with Ticillo on the reign's duration of 40 years. Given that the foundation of Rome was in 753 BC, Malmitius's reign was 439 to 399 BC. This is right for Malmitius's son Brennus to be the enemy commander at the sack of Rome in 390 BC and to be named as such by the Roman historian Livy. We're talking about the sack of Rome, by the son of Malmitius, the ancient creator of the British common law system, which still, though hidden from view, exists today. It's never been repealed. It couldn't be repealed because it requires a convention of the people. It cannot be repealed by any so-called government, especially a government of usurpers, pirates and genocidal maniacs. The ancient laws of Cambria, William Probart, circa 1823. These triads are remarkably curious and interesting. They throw great light upon the manners and customs of the old Britons, and in many cases breathe a spirit of freedom that would not disgrace the polish of the 19th century. These triads also merit attention on account of their antiquity. 
They were framed by Divinwal Molmud, who flourished about 400 years before the Christian era and consequently are upwards of 2,000 years old. There are three tests of civil liberty. Equality of rights, equality of taxation, freedom to come and go. There are three causes which ruin a state. Inordinate privileges, corruption of justice and national apathy. Ring any bells? <laughs> there are three things which cannot be considered solid longer than their foundations are solid. Peace, property and law. Three things are indispensable to a true union of nations. Sameness of laws, rights and language. There are three things free to all Britons. The forest, the unworked mine, the right of hunting wild creatures. There are three things which are private and sacred property in every man, Briton or foreigner. His wife, his children, his domestic chattels. There are three things belonging to a man which no law of men can touch, fine or transfer. His wife, his children and the instruments of his calling. For no law can unman a man or uncall a calling. There are three persons. Is that a legal fiction? Is it? No. They're talking about men and women. They're not talking about a legal fiction. There are three persons in a family exempted from all manual or menial work. The little child, the old man or woman, and the family instructor, the tutor, the educator, the real educator. There are three orders against whom no weapon can be bared. The herald, the bard, and the head of a clan. There are three of private rank against whom no weapon can be bared, a woman, a child under 15, and an unarmed man. There are three things that require the unanimous vote of the nation to effect, the deposition of the sovereign, the introduction of novelties in religion, and suspension of law. There are three civil birthrights of every Briton, the right to go wherever he pleases, the right wherever he is to protection from his land and sovereign, the right of equal privileges and equal restrictions. There are three property birthrights of every Briton. Five British acres of land for a home, the right of armorial bearings, the right to carry arms, the right of suffrage, which is voting, in the enacting of the laws, the male at 21, the female on her marriage, so the women generally marry before 21, had a vote before the men. There are three guarantees of society, security for life and limb, Security for property, security of the rights of nature. There are three sons of captives who free themselves, a bard, a scholar, a mechanic. There are three things the safety of which depends on that of the others, the sovereignty, national courage, and just administration of the laws. There are three things which every Briton may legally be compelled to attend, the worship of God, military service, and the courts of law. For three things a Briton is pronounced a traitor and forfeits his rights. Emigration, collusion with an enemy, and surrendering himself and living under an enemy. There are three things free to every man, Briton or foreigner, the refusal of which no law will justify. Water from a spring, river or well, firing from a decayed tree, a block of stone not in use. There are three orders who are exempt from bearing arms, the bard, the judge, the graduate in law or religion. These represent God and his peace, and no weapon must ever be found in their hand. There are three kinds of sonship, a son by marriage with a native Briton, an illegitimate son acknowledged on oath by his father, and a son adopted out of the clan. But that goes for daughters as well. There are three whose power is kingly in law, the sovereign paramount of Britain over all Britain and its isles, the princes palatine in their princedoms, and the heads of the clans in their clans. Three are the thieves who shall not suffer punishment, a woman compelled by her husband, a child, a necessitous person who has gone through three towns and a nine houses in each town without being able to obtain charity though he asked for it. There are three ends of law, prevention of wrong, punishment for wrongs inflicted, and insurance of just retribution. There are three lawful castigations, of a son by a father, of a kinsman by the head of a clan, of a soldier by his officer. The chief of a clan, when marshalling his men, may strike his man three ways, with his baton, with the flat of his sword, with his open hand. Each of these is a correction, not an insult. There are three sacred things by which the conscience binds itself to truth, the name of God, the rod of him who offers up prayers to God, 
the joined right hand. There are three persons who have a right to public maintenance, the old, the babe, the foreigner who cannot speak the British tongue. We're certainly not talking about a set of laws which could all be applied today fairly, equitably or justly, but many of them could be, and many of them still form the basis of the common law. Alfred the Great, the so-called Anglo-Saxon lawmaker, he incorporated the Mormontine laws into the Saxon laws before all of the indigenous tribes of Britain, as opposed to the invading tribes, had been wiped out. 